that provides services for seniors in the center where you are. I'd just like to welcome all of you today to this event to honor and recognize and appreciate one of our very special, special people, Henry Talbert. Henry named this agency People Coordinated Services, the name that it now The agency was organized in 1939. It was known as the uh, Church Welfare Bureau, the Protestant Community Services, and now People Coordinated Services. This agency over the years has evolved and developed services and programs to serve the greater Los Angeles community since 1939. It's been a United Way agency since 1941. In its recent history, the agency has identified programs to provide services for our elderly. This is our multi-service center where a variety of services are provided here at this particular facility. We have six different sites where we provide congregate meal services for the elderly. We provide 200 meals a day for the homebound elderly. And we have a 64-bed facility for substance abuse rehabilitation. We have a 59-bed facility for substance abuse rehabilitation. We have a facility for youth and family services at 3021 South Vermont. And we also coordinate and work with other groups in our community to plan and develop services to better serve our people in our community. So this is really social work at work mm -hmm. in the agencies. Mm -hmm. And Henry has been an integral part of that over the years and has continued to be a very close friend of the agency and has really been there for us for whatever we needed him for. So it really is very fitting that today the archives <coughs> is back in a homebound and a home supported agency to honor one of our very young. I really would like to welcome all of you. We have former staff members of People Coordinated Services. We have friends. We have uh, board members, and we have some staff here. And this agency belongs to our community to serve our community. It belongs to you because as people who are interested in the community, you are part of it. <coughs> Henry also has family here. He has his grandchildren, so we have intergenerational kinds of relationships here. And, uh, it's really wonderful to have the cross-section that we have here. And I would like for all of you to just give yourself a hand for being here. <laughs> so at this time, I'd like to introduce our, our mistress of ceremonies, Edwina Ferrance. Edwina Ferrance is a 37-year staff member of People Coordinated Services. <laughs> long years ago as a staff member of the <laughs> So, you know, this really is a connecting and a homecoming and a home sharing week <coughs> for all of us. It went up for us. Thank you, Evelyn, and good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <coughs> Yes, that has been a long time ago, but I'd like to say, I'd like to commend this committee for initiating this occasion to pay tribute to and to spend an afternoon with a person who very much deserves that, Henry Talbot. Henry has given much of himself over the years, and as I'm sure as we move into the program, we will hear more about that. And now, at this time, I would like to bring to you 
Francis Feldman, who is a social work professor emerita of the University of Southern California, who will bring you a description of the archives of the social welfare. Francis Feldman. because Henry is one of my long-time friends, is that better? <laughs> see why I have to see the rest of you. Uh, I have known Henry, I won't say how many years, but a long time. And we have worked together in many contexts, but during the last seven or eight years especially, uh, he has been a very important part of the California Social Welfare Archives. I think probably all of you have been unable to escape hearing some of this rhetoric that comes out of Washington and a little from Sacramento about welfare and related issues. And for many, this is rhetoric that we have heard before. And I think it's important to note that a group of social workers and volunteers in the field of social welfare in 1978 felt that we were losing some important historical items because they were not being saved, people who had them, agencies that were closing were just simply disposing of them, they were lost, and we need those in order to look back at what has happened to get the insights from the past so we can see what we should be doing in the present and the future. I don't think the folks in Washington have heard about social welfare archives, but I hope someday they will. But as I listen to these people, and I think of some of the things that we have been collecting uh, in these last 10 and to 20 years that repeat some of the same language, that offer some of the same proposals for helping people, increasingly important that we have the reservoir of these collected items which form our history, otherwise we don't remember what has happened. We have no way of documenting what we think is important today. So our group has been in the process of gathering information, all kinds of memorabilia from social agencies, from individual leaders in the field, no matter what they have done, but that they're for or against what we stand for, it's still important to know what it is that they have to say. We have used the Arlene Johnson Social Work Library at USC as a repository. We now have a very fine collection of materials there that are available for people to review if they want to see what social policy has been and perhaps what they would like to work on now. During the last two years, we have been focusing on the collection of materials about ethnic minorities. Those have been lost along the way with few exceptions. And we have several committees which are focused on the collections for particular minority groups. One is the one that has arranged this meeting today. It's chaired by Helen Maxwell here, who is a great member of our board. Uh, and it focuses on uh, African American collections. This meeting is a part of that. We are now also collecting material about Asians and Pacific Rim people, and about Hispanics and Native Americans. I think this committee has gone faster and further than the others have, because it has some great people on it. Are you going to introduce them? Yes. All right, I will mention them, because she will. Uh, but I am very pleased to have an opportunity to be here with you today, to help to honor Henry, to remind you that if you know of people who have materials that deal with what has happened in the past, even if it's not in the very distant past, someday it will be, that so we'll take it from today back to as far as you can go. 
we would like to have them. Thank you for having this affair today. Thank you, Dr. Bell. And now to introduce the committee, <laughs> of African American Collection Committee that is, is Helen Maxwell, who is the director of McLaurin Children's Center, the Department of Children and Family Services of LA County. Helen Maxwell. <coughs> event today could not have been possible without all of the hard work of our subcommittee of the African American Collection Committee and I'd like to open and begin by thanking them and uh, acknowledging them. Um, Dr. June Brown, could you say hello? Thank you. Um, Dr. Joe Yelder. Ann Shaw, okay. who has a, who's going who's to uh, have quite a few things to add to our collection, and um, Henry Talbert, who has worked very, very hard. I'm going to just tell you a little something about this man who we're here today to really um, honor. Um, he is a member of this committee. And uh, it was very difficult planning without having one of our lead members here. But I want you to know that he was here an hour before the event and informed me that he was a member of this committee and he was here to work. So I think that really tells you about this, this, this wonderful man. Um, as the, um, our, we feel that, you know, our committee, like the other committees, is very, very important because it does set a place for us to go and look at the contributions of African Americans to the whole field of uh, social welfare. And uh, Henry has been a wonderful member. He has made tremendous contributions. And... Um, we're going to hear about those later he brought on. Me a document today. And he's yeah. also brought a document today. <coughs> right. Let's give me a chance. Thank you, Helen. And now we will have the opportunity to reminisce with Henry. The person that is going to conduct this part of the program gets my vote as Volunteer of the Decade, and that is Anne Shaw, oh, reminiscent you. with Henry Talbert. It's so funny because our subcommittee had planned to present Mr. Talbert with a lovely flower for his hotel. I only discovered that Henry is allergic to flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm presenting you instead to the subcommittee. The Images of Dignity from Charles White, one of our very famous. And since, since this is to have been a conversation with Henry, I thought that rather than telling you about his accomplishments, that we would just give him the opportunity of telling you about his accomplishments himself. I think it's uh, very appropriate that we honor him. We've been friends for years. As uh, my husband and his late wife, he is a man of incredible giving to me, like Charles White's work. He has worked for the images of dignity in our people and all people. And him to ask you just to start out telling us about your family life, how you how did you happen to, to enter the School of Social Work? What was it like during those days? What were your experiences at the school? How many other Afro-Americans were your classmates? What were the times like? Thank you very much, Anne. And let me thank you also for having this activity of which I'm a part. I, uh, when I looked at the announcement of the program and it said social welfare pioneer, I thought I should tell you that I didn't grow up with Booker T. Washington. 
<laughs> then when I saw the setting, the Senior Citizen Center, I said I should have brought my pajamas to just stay open at night and be in line to uh, register tomorrow. But one other bit of humor, uh, as I was thinking about what would transpire today, I thought of the story of this man who wanted to enter a monastery and he had committed himself to whatever the regulations would be and presented himself for his induction and the head monk uh, was orienting him to what he would be facing and everything he said seemed uh, quite reasonable until he said you, know, you have to <coughs> excuse me take an oath of silence and aside from the normal uh, exchange of words and so forth you cannot say anything but two words every five years. And the person looked at him and he tested his commitment. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. So at the end of the first five years, uh, they brought him into the, office in the monastery. And the person said, well, you have done okay. Let's hear the two words. He says, bad food. <laughs> Five years later, in the end of the tenth year, he was brought before the group and they said, uh, you can say two more words. And the fellow said, um, hard bed. And you know the sleeping accommodations in the monastery. So at the end of 15 years, and I guess this was the crucial time, he said, okay, let's hear what you want to say now. And the fellow said, I quit. <laughs> that wasn't the end of it. The, uh, and the monk looked at him and he says, I suspected that you've done nothing but grumble the last 15 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, very briefly, uh, I came from a, uh, not a functional family, but a broken family. I was trying to figure out over the last week, uh, my mother died uh, the day before my fifth birthday. Uh, my father started traveling about three years later, and for the next 14 or 15 years, as near as I could figure out, we had eight months together. He spent his time traveling overseas with a musical group, and it was just when I finished uh, undergraduate school that I spent two years traveling with him, not as a singer, but just as a companion. And so. In this total span of life, I suppose probably 10 or 12 years was spent with the father. I had one sister, and we were separated, I think, when I must have been about nine years old. And since then, I saw her probably about a year and a half in our lives. So uh, when it, and I, my father had no relatives that he could remember except one lady that I'm trying to emulate. She lived until 108. <laughs> uh, so that was pretty much so. We, Our family was scattered when I uh, uh, went to Kentucky from my home. I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I went to Kentucky and they, my father put us in a little boarding school. Well, the school folded the year after I got there. <laughs> so then one of the men that signed with him had relatives in uh, a place in Danville, Kentucky, famous for Center College, which beat Harvard one year, 6 nothing. Uh, I spent some time there. My sister left them to go on and do her four years of uh, high school and then four years college in another state. So that sort of broke up the relationship. And then uh, they, I was singing in the high school quartet, and a little group of persons came from a college in Mississippi. And I, I haven't thought too much about Mississippi as being a place I would want to uh, carry on my education, but I was talked into going down <laughs> and getting uh, free tuition to travel with the quartet. And uh, so I spent two years in a little junior college, and then got an athletic scholarship to move on to another uh, college, which was run by the Congregational Churches. And our faculty was very interesting. In the state of Mississippi, everything was separate. And so the faculty 
uh, <coughs> came down from the schools along the Atlantic Coast, Brown University and some of the other schools as a part of what they call the American Missionary Association's uh, concern about uh, social activities. And, but those teachers, uh, they were non, what were we then, non-colored, non-Negro. <laughs> well, they, they were white. Uh, <laughs> They were ostracized in the community, so we had a great deal of bonding because there was a great deal of uh, antipathy shown toward them because here they were helping uh, the black persons to try to advance themselves intellectually. So uh, I completed my undergraduate work there. And just one little aside, that's where I first met USC because after the Army, I went in the Army and was uh, found. Uh, I'd gone back to Cleveland to live there, and they found me there. So I had, after finishing college, had traveled the two years with my father and his group, and we made, I think, about five trips across the country. And uh, so I thought I was safe because if the Army noticed Cleveland, I said, well, Pasadena, I decided to move out here. And they finally caught up with Pasadena with me. And uh, I was among the first eight African-American persons to be uh, uh, called by the draft board in Pasadena. And so anxious was I to avoid going into the service that uh, when we heard that they were taking so many persons from Pasadena, I called the draft board. And I said, I understand you're taking some people in. And they said, yes, we are. Uh, they said, what's your name? And I told them, they said, you're one of them. <laughs> Anyway, I, I put the time in, in the Army four years, and there at the job, and I guess that gave me my first inclination toward social work, because uh, as I moved up in rank, uh, I had uh, the spy job for the regiment, which was horrible. Even though we were stateside, we were to uh, uh, let the, our command know which persons among our regiment, that had 2,300 men, in the regiment, I guess close to 100 officers, and my job was the head of the, uh, they called it intelligence division. It was really the spy <laughs> system of the army here stateside. And every, I had a, in every barrack, I think we had about, uh, we had person, 63 persons to a barrack, and we had a man in every barrack, one of our soldiers, and I had some officers, lieutenants, and so forth, and every Monday morning, in my little office, I would get little sheets of paper in an envelope. Uh, we use the name A, able, uh, anxious, I was anxiety, so forth. <laughs> they, we would get this report from each of these barracks as to the state of condition. Many of the soldiers, we were at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, and eight of us were the first officers, regular army officers, sent to that part of the country, and we got a interesting welcome from the colonel when we reported. He said, well, nobody else wanted you, but I said, I'll take them. And, uh, he said, if you do all right, uh, I'll take care of you. And if you don't, remember, I'm from, and he named the southern state. Well, we did all right. But as, as a part of this intelligence gathering activity, uh, we ran across any number of soldiers who had an awful lot of problems. My office was next to the chaplain's office on the base. The guys would start to the chaplain, and he looked <coughs> so religious, so holy, and I looked so, I guess, a little less than that. <laughs> so they would stop in my place, and so I heard many of the problems that they had. And one thing I think that really, we, we had a first lieutenant, and he would constantly write and call the governor of West Virginia, saying how bad things were at Fort Benning, Georgia. And so I was assigned by our colonel to uh, put a tail on him. I didn't realize that while I was checking on him, other people were checking on me. The FBI was tied in with the military uh, intelligence division. Two members from my church have arrived, uh, educators both. Uh, so this sort of instilled in me the fact that when I left the Army, uh, maybe I ought to get into some helping people field. And uh, when I left the Army in Indianapolis, uh, they said, maybe you ought to get into something 
uh, like social, social with people. I don't think the corporal knew what social work was. I, I knew less about it at the time. And uh, so I came, I started to get a job in the Y, and I decided I'd like to come back to California. And got there, and then someone told me about uh, USC, the uh, School of Social Work. Well, by that time, I had taken a job with the Protestant uh, Community Services, and they told me I was a, a social group worker. I said, oh, wonderful. I didn't know really what that was, but <laughs> I quickly learned because I think one of, one of my colleagues, uh, Mrs. Mary Strong, former YW exec, you were, you were there already. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so we had uh, quite a time, and I went over to SC to enroll. Uh, it was a very embarrassing moment. Uh, not only was I apprehensive <coughs> about what had I to offer, would I be accepted, but in standing in the line there in the registrar's office, I think I was behind a girl from who had finished Stevens College in Missouri, rather a sophisticated a girl's school, and I think I was in boy who had moved out here from the Midwest, and I think his undergraduate work was at uh, Ohio State. And so they talked to, uh, I heard them ask the lady, what's your school? Stevens College. And then they got to me, uh, what's your school? I said, uh, Tupelo. <laughs> the registrar's assistant said, uh, what, what was that? How do you spell it? Yes, like <laughs> Uh, well, someone else asked me about Tougaloo once, and they said, spell it, and I said, why A-L-E? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm sorry, I was so embarrassed. The lady was so nice, and she said, Tougaloo, uh, where is that? And I was almost crying. I said, Mississippi. <laughs> she had to go in the back room somewhere to look up the accreditation manuals, and much to her surprise and my delight, we found out that Tougaloo was an accredited college, and there was no makeup of anything that had to be done. So I presented myself on a time to the School of so Social Work, and we were not uh, we were not overrun with uh, persons of my uh, uh, background. I can recall two or three persons. There was a Thurman Fletcher, and there was a Bernice Wright, I think, who was uh, in the class at that time. Uh, there were other very friendly persons. I think I interacted with, uh, I think, Ben Cohen, who was here, Carl Schaefer, uh, Chauncey Alexander, Jack Stump, so some of the real heavies. So I had some real role models to follow. So I would say that the acceptance into the university went without uh, incident. And I, I may have worn my uniform, I think, the first time to try to impress someone. <laughs> I was so glad to get out of the Army, and I must have been the only African American to get out that year because I, I, out of the Army, because I got into the school without a difficulty. And aside from uh, having a little interesting dialogue one time with Dean Arlene Johnson, one of the professors, uh, we had to give our impression of what social work was, and I, uh, was not trying to be facetious, not being, trying to be cute. But I said innocently, well, I, I look at social work as being the art of making uh, simple things complex. And, well, I, I went to see, slide through that course. <laughs> That's pretty much how I got into, I was having children at the time. Well, my wife and I. And, uh, so it, uh, I, didn't, I couldn't do too much on the campus. I think I, I worked, was active with the focus. I remember doing, of all things, doing the foreword for an article by Professor Harley Trekker. It's there in the copy of the fact brought today. But that was, that was USC. I, I was what there. What your field work experiences? And could you tell us something about the pictures there on the board? Oh, well, field work, uh, this was, I believe, the one year when SC was experimenting with uh, trying to do work in the three different principal areas. So I did, uh, I did two semesters of field work with the boys club in Pasadena because group work seemed to have been what they thought I was ticketed for. Then I did one uh, semester with the Bureau of Public Assistance. I was the caseworker and one interesting uh, thing happened, uh, I, I had to get used to 
of being an anonymous person. The worker did this, the worker did that, <laughs> with Ms. S or Mrs. Y. And so I remember one report going into my supervisor and said, worker went to see Mrs. C and went to us, and Mrs. C invited me in and then said, come into the bedroom and just sit on the bed. And I didn't realize that the house wasn't much more than that bedroom, and so I sat down, and then uh, my interrogator, or my supervisor, said, well, what did that mean, Mr. Talbert, uh, her asking you to sit on the bed? And I thought, I said, well, I just thought that she was tired and I was tired. <laughs> so so I, I went on into the, went on into the uh, next placement, which was in uh, community organization. So I did one semester in community org, and so there were these three different disciplines. Uh, I, Cooperg, I see uh, Dr. Milner there, and I, I recall the, the wonderful relationship we had. He was extremely generous in, in, in giving out grades, so there wasn't the need to make up works and words and things of that nature. Uh, so these were the three areas, but these was done on social group work. Did you have a hard time getting your first job? What was it? Well, I just had two jobs in life, uh, uh, the Church Welfare Bureau and the National Urban League. I, I didn't count the army of job because that wasn't something I aspired to <laughs> but, uh, And I was actually working at the Church Welfare Bureau at the time. And they allowed me, and then under the GI Bill, trying to rear a family, uh, there wasn't too much I could do about trying to get in the fraternity and riding around in a convertible, so <laughs> I uh, didn't, didn't get involved. So then with, well, with the National Urban League, I had been, I think, at the Church Welfare Bureau about 15 years, and somehow I had the feeling that a person of the magnitude and the capacities of an Evelyn Knight would come along at some point, it just seemed a good time for me to move on out. And Chauncey Alexander talked to me about the National Urban League. By that time, I was involved with NASW, and he and I were sort of moving in tandem. And Swallow, that was the predecessor to NASW, National Association of Social Workers. So uh, I, I guess uh, Chauncey talked to somebody in New York, and uh, Lester Granger, and I, I actually, incidentally worked under four National Urban League executives, uh, Lester Granger, Whitney Young, Vernon Jordan, and one of our former executives in San Diego, we John Jacob. Yeah, that was yeah. nice. Tell me, uh, I recently heard something about you being honored by the National Urban League as an outstanding staff. staff. Uh, Yes, they, uh, they they had to do something every year for somebody, and I, uh, <laughs> they, uh, and they had to make distinctions. We had, uh, I guess, 113 executives, and one of my one of my models, and my successor, Ernie Cooper, sitting over there, uh, was the. I met him when I first went in the league, and sort of uh, we would meet regional staffs would meet periodically in New York and I learned to count him as a real good friend and uh, was able to kind of ape, ape some of the things that uh, he was doing because he was the deputy in our largest regional office in Chicago so uh, I had the opportunity to I think pick his brains and other persons brains around the country and they that since we were so far from New York and uh, Vernon or Whitney couldn't come out here as often as they would have liked to supervise us, they felt that things were moving along fairly well. And so I guess I was the first non-New York-based staff to get the, what they call the Tannehill Award. Oh, it's, there it's, it's, it's over there on oh. the bottom part. It's, it's been hidden in the house and it's, the glue came off. I'll face it when I go home. Those of you who know Henry know that's not the whole story. <laughs> Tell us about uh, your family, your younger family, your grandchildren. You talked about them so much. Your sons, I know how 
Well, I have two sons. Uh, one is in New York. His son, Eli, would you take a bow, please? Uh, <laughs> service and found out that uh, that university, I think 174 years old, had the commencement plan for the ellipse behind the White House. We got there that morning. His dad came in from Princeton and his mother. We went there and we were turned back because they said the rain had, they had rained out the commencement. First time in the history of George Washington knew that my grandson was very disappointed because he couldn't get the uh, sheepskin. And uh, didn't they decide to have you come back some other time, Eli? They're having three more services, the final one being next year on the White House lawn. So well, hopefully the, the same president will be there. He <laughs> <laughs> the Washington Post that he had no backup plan. Eli was uh, radio and television. We saw his apartment. He was packing up to come out here. He wanted to come to Hollywood, although he was born in New York City. Uh, he had in his apartment, and he brought it out with him, a full-length uh, figure, cardboard, of Marilyn Monroe. And we said, what is that? He said, that was his project. He had a video on Marilyn Monroe, and he brought it out here on his car. I saw it in his apartment out in West L.A., but he's now working uh, in the studios uh, on some of the film. So we're all wishing him well. Uh, they, he's my son, Henry's son, who works with the U.S. Tennis Association. Couldn't come out because they're in the final day of the U.S. Open. Uh, my other son, who lives in L.A., is a musician and now is doing marketing research when it's available has two children, Kelly, would you stand please? Uh, uh, Kelly Clay was uh, in the child development field. Uh, she married the daughter of the owner of the Mary Clay School. Son. 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 Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> So her husband, uh, Eric Clay, is the son of the owner, Mary Clay. Mary Clay. And Kelly is sort of almost the acting director, are you not, Kelly? Yes. And uh, she's done some modeling and some other things. She's very up in photography. Her brother, Alan Jr., <laughs> University of California, Santa Barbara, and is working with a money management group in West LA as a as an accountant auditor, and is in, they're sending him to school for a graduate degree in accounting. Several things. I'll reel them off very rapidly. We had a very fascinating staff in the regional office. Our job was to pull together the various urban league activities in the West. And uh, I think one of our great uh, joys was in after running the Los Angeles Urban League out of our office for about, I think, a year. We had staff and we actually ran it after a Mr. Wesley Brazier left, and then his successor came and was there a year. And before John Mack came, I think we were very blessed to be able to recruit the person of the statue of John Mack. Uh, he, without a doubt, uh, moves in the highest corporate and other circles of Los Angeles. And when persons are asked to express <coughs> opinions, not just on the area of civil rights, but education and other things, uh, we're pleased that John Mack was one. Uh, another thought was that we were so far removed from the East that we could do a lot of uh, improvising 
or trying to come up with new ideas. Uh, another contact with USC, uh, my assignment when I first came was to raise $100,000 to keep the office going and put on a conference. Well, we put the conference on. <laughs> and, uh, we got Dr. Van Arsdale from USC, I think he was in the demography department, to do a study of non-whites in the West. And we put on a conference at the Fairmont Hotel in San Francisco. And we looked at uh, the whole region, because I was being oriented at the time to what this West was like. And our region extended from Colorado out to Hawaii and Alaska. So we were gone most of the time. Our staff was a traveling staff. Um, so one of the highlights was really getting to understand the dynamics of the West. And now they have changed dramatically with the infusion of other colored peoples from around the world. And we did a number of conferences that we worked with the La Raza. Uh, I think one of the things that I would like to feel that the regional office had some say was Congressman Hawkins sent a te telegram to our office one day, said, we need to have you in our office, someone out there at his office in Manchester and Broadway. We went out there and left being the head of the convener of the Citizens Anti-Poverty Committee. Uh, this was a group, it included people, uh, activists from East Los Angeles, from the West Side, and we spent an awful lot of time trying to get Mayor Sam Yorty to approve what had to come out of the mayor's office to get the poverty program officially started in Los Angeles. Uh, that was something that, with some leadership from the regional office, we were able to pull. I think another thing, and our work is not confined just to Los Angeles, at least 15 trips were made to the state of Utah, and that was a state that did not really put black people on a pedestal. So uh, it was quite difficult to break through that barrier with a very fine group. I understood, uh, I learned that the Mormon group uh, had some of the most sophisticated social welfare services. I was aghast when I went over to speak at the Utah Conference of Social Welfare and they took the break. And having moved around with social workers who were kind of free-spirited when it came to the spirits, uh, we went to the coffee break. I thought it was a coffee break, and I went out in the Hotel Utah, the foyer, and they had tables filled with glasses of milk. And I had to get accustomed to genuine milk from cows. <laughs> so it was interesting working in that milieu, I guess you would call it. And uh, when we went to set up an organizing committee for an urban league, the leader of the committee was a priest in one of the states in Alton, Utah, and most of the committee were Mormons. And it was interesting, uh, I see Dave Saunders here from United Way, it was interesting to find out that uh, we were trying to see if we could tap the United Way in Salt Lake City in, in Ogden for money to get an urban league started. And they said, no, we give our money to the NAACP. I said, well, the Mormons are quite different. <laughs> but then, um, moving along, uh, watching the, the change in the Mormon religion, and we cannot take credit for that, but I think we were visible signs of this other group that was in need of services. And we went to see a job corps camp in Layton, Utah, and on the way back in, uh, I stopped to get uh, some soda on the way in, and people were so nice, how do you do, how do you do? And I got back into Salt Lake City, and we were staying near uh, Mormon Square, and the people were so nice, the ZCI had a big mall there uh, near the temple, and the people were so nice. Well, I had read just before I went there that the head of the Mormon church went to sleep and had a revelation about <laughs> black people in the Mormon church. And I saw in the paper that they had, the revelation was being effected, and they were going to now make people of color 
of members of the Mormon Church, the part of the hierarchy, not the Council of the Twelve. So when I realized these people were so polite, I said, my God, they don't think I'm going to be the first Mormon priest. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing uh, I think of, and I know time is running short, uh, you recall the Kent State uh, mm -hmm. problem with the National Guard. Mm -hmm. Our executive in Tacoma was on good standing with the adjutant general of the Washington State National Guard. And so he called and he says, I think we got something going up here with the general. They are very, very shy. They're really embarrassed about shooting up those students at Kent State and the one other uh, college during the uh, peace movement. And he says, they want to do something. So he asked us to get in touch. We contacted the National Guard Bureau and the Pentagon, worked out a deal where in order for them to kind of salvage some of their image, they agreed to work with the Western Regional Office and make a plane available, a military plane out of Washington, if we could find out some way to get visibility. So our staff sat down and uh, we contacted the, their person and made arrangements. They went to the Pentagon. Uh, they cut orders for, I think, about 25 of our, uh, of our executives around the region and some of their senior staff. And we crafted a plan where our 12 urban leagues uh, all sent their executives and another staff to Denver they flew the plane out from uh, Washington, and we had command of that Air Force plane. And one of the senators at the same time was studying the use of military aircraft by so many of the senators. But we had that plane for a week. We started in Denver. We hit all of the western states where we had affiliates. The adjutant generals, Colorado, Utah, were put on orders to provide space and transportation for these persons. So we visited every urban league and we had asked our execs to put together something that you feel is unique. And then the other execs critiqued each urban league and on the plane we had a changing of the guard. We had one guy from one of the California cities and he wore a dashiki all the time. You'll know him, Ernie. And, but when we got to his city, March Air Force Base, he went in the back in the galley of the plane and came out with a suit and tie. So he was a militant everywhere except in his own urban city. <laughs> but that helped, and then we did some things. I have some pictures of, of our entourage, but it was a week long. And they put all of our people on military orders, so we didn't have to worry about uh, transportation uh, or lodging. Uh, that was one of the other things. Other, the final thing I'll mention is uh, a little anecdotal thing regarding USC again. Uh, the university of years back was beginning to buy up land around, around the campus, extending out Western Avenue and west, toward Western Jefferson. And community people were very upset, frankly, about the university usurping uh, some of the land. And, and the domain, I had to say. You I heard about that, that. that. Well, we had an exec just before John Mack came, and he came off our national staff, Stanley. And uh, he was a, quite a go-getter. Uh, he had a, a Freedom Football Classic, and Vernon Jordan was yeah. riding on a mule wagon in a Brooks Brothers suit, uh, yeah. kicking yeah. off this football game. You know, Vernon, he's not the most uh, mild person on earth. So anyway, our executive in the LA Urban League uh, called our office and we're going to uh, we're going to pick it, USC, and we've got a group of community people organized to go around and march around on Hoover and Vermont. And he says, "You're our leader, so we're expecting you to come and march with us." Well, I was in a very tough spot because there was a great deal of ferment going on our national board as to whether the National Urban League could uh, sanction picketing by our local affiliates. And I said, "Well, I'll, uh, I'll work with you." That morning, I got out there and made, uh, our exec was carrying the picket sign, and I had a spiral notebook that I picked up from one of our staff, and I walked beside him as if I were interviewing him. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
probably have so much more to tell us. I say the only thing that's amazing, my, my late husband was on the treasurer of the National Board. Went to many of those meetings, but I never heard him having milk. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly converted. <laughs> uh, I know that uh, you want to introduce Helen. I know that you want to introduce the guests who are here. We want Henry to meet the people who are here to listen to you. Maybe you'd like to do it. Maybe, why don't we have each table, Helen, introduce okay. themselves? Okay. Um, or maybe we should have a few questions from well, the audience. Who is that, though, Henry? Uh, could you, uh, Oh, right, fine. The yes, and then we'll... All right. And Rena is going to give us our direction for the future. Uh, join us in just cutting the first slice of cake, and then we'll serve everyone while they tell us, or they reminisce, and uh, give us remarks. Okay, thank you very much. We'd like to give the audience a chance to paint in reminiscence with Mr. Talbot, because we know many of you have worked with him, so we want you to join us now in the cake cutting where we'll serve dessert and while we're serving the dessert you will get an opportunity to come up and we're going to ask you to limit your remarks to two minutes each okay thank you you lead the way to the cake mr talbot
uh, youth project days, I mean, all those kinds of things that we were trying to make relationships between churches and the community and various organizations. And if there's anyone who has the real special talent and skill um, for making, th making things happen when you put people together, it's Henry. Um, he really learned a lot. But I, I can't do that, but he's still doing it. Um, also, I, one of the things that he always used to say was that he would make the big decisions, and the rest of the staff would make the little ones. <laughs> Most decisions were little ones. <laughs> but somehow or other things happened, you know. I mean, it was, he had, has great faith in people. And um, it was a very creative organization, and mostly because he allowed the individuals in the organization to be creative, and that made, you know, made for success. It was one of the most, um, you know, very special periods in my life. And probably the crowning glory was my wedding, where Henry and the quartet sang in the wedding, which was really wonderful, and something I will never forget. I have a tape, <laughs> so I can't forget. Anyway, I have a lot to thank you for, Henry. Uh, you introduced me to USC because I became a student supervisor, and uh, I probably wouldn't have done it if it hadn't been for that relationship. So I thank you, and you deserve all the credit and acclamation you're getting today. Thank you, Mary. And Roland? On my core. <laughs> I started working, thank you to Henry, um, in 1957 when I graduated from UCLA. Now, my background was home economics. What was I doing in group work? That's a good question. <laughs> but he had faith in me. He seemed to think that I could do something. And uh, they took me on. And I had a wonderful experience there. And I worked with a lot of young children. And uh, I think one of the prof most profound moments that I had with a group of uh, sixth grade uh, black children, girls. One time they, they were driving around going somewhere and they said to me, Miss Ann, why are people prejudiced? Why do they have to be prejudiced? And then I, I looked up at the heavens and I said, dear God, please help me. <laughs> but I, gave, I came out with an answer. I said, you know, you have to be facing prejudice now. This was just before Watts and a lot of things that were happening in the early 60s, you know. I said, but historically, being prejudiced, he was being persecuted. Different groups throughout history have faced persecution. And I said, right now, you young children are of a group that are facing some of this. And that seemed to satisfy them up to a point. They realized that they just were not the only ones picked out from the heavens to be picked up. And I think that um, it helped me to feel better about everything because my people were picked on too. I come from an ethnic group, the Greeks, they were called the Greasy Greeks. And uh, all that, when everybody was starting to come over to this country, you know. But Henry also taught me how to love people of all backgrounds. And I think this was my first real experience of working in a small United Nations at that time. You remember? We had American Indian. I forgot the name of that young man. He went back south, but he was a nice young fellow. You're all nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he kind of, he was a spirit behind us all. And I thanked him a lot. May I, may I add to that? Yeah. The other thing he did that he doesn't remember is when I was dating Anne at this time, I'm her husband, he told us about the Rubiot Room, which was a nightclub, and I'm a jazz buff, and so I owe you that. Thank you, Anne and Ted. And now Mardina, Mardina Moore. You come forth, please. Good afternoon. 
afternoon, everyone. I'm not a social worker, but I am a friend of I'm with the Crippled Children's Society of Southern California, where Mr. Talbert serves on the board of directors, along with me, I'm the corporate secretary, and I'm uh, very much involved with Crippled Children's Society, and so is Mr. Talbert. And we are very pleased to have him to be a member of our board. Uh, Mr. Talbert serves on the Harry Minor Center Board, he's in Inglewood, part of the Crippled Children's Society, and in other phases he works with us. So I think it's wonderful that you're saluting Mr. Talbert this afternoon, and uh, I know he has been a very, very successful community person, and I've known him for many years, so congratulations Mr. Talbert, and congratulations to those who thought of this idea. Thank you. Thank you. Are there others? like to say again I commend this committee for having the foresight to initiate this um, patient for Henry Talbot. He very much deserves it. Uh, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the Henry that I know. I came to work for the agency then known as the Church Welfare Bureau of the Church Federation of Los Angeles in November 1951. And the first person that I met was a uh, young Japanese young lady by the name of Kazue Inoue who turned out to be Henry Talbot's secretary. So having met her, I met her boss. Cos and I became good friends, and they occupied the cottage in the rear of the Haggerty Mansion, as Mary Strong has already mentioned to you. And I found myself out there many times because the group work division, and I was in casework division, secretary in the casework division, we uh, got along real well. Mr. Talbot organized a singing group and of this group, there were some staff people from Church Welfare Bureau. There were community people, Japanese, Jewish, Catholic. And he had us singing various churches in the community. I guess our biggest engagement was when we sang, uh, aside from singing at Mary's reception, we sang at Jess Unruh's reception. He was dabbling in politics at that time, but that was certainly before he became Speaker of the Assembly and Treasurer of the State of California. But we did sing at his reception. Henry was very talented musically, and he likes arranging music, and he kept us busy doing that. I recall another incident when, um, of course, a Church Welfare Bureau, later Protestant Community Services, now known as People Coordinated Services, is a United Way agency. And there was a time when staff were required to conduct a cleanup campaign. Maybe Mr. Dave Saunders remembers that. And in conducting the cleanup campaign, staff members of the various United Way agencies would go door to door canvassing United Way. I had the fortune or misfortune to have been signed to work with a group headed by Mr. Talbot. <laughs> And he worked us really very well. We uh, couldn't even stop to get a coke, and that's always been one of the things we teased him about. He was so dedicated and committed that he wanted us to keep on the job of collecting for United Way. He has always made a, a real commitment into whatever he was doing, and I am honored that I was asked to serve as the MC of this program for a person whom I esteem very highly. Others of you who may wish to speak? Dr. Yelder. I would be ignoring history if I didn't make some hmm. comments about Henry and I said, you know, I don't remember when I really remember meeting you, except that it was tied to social work. And it was at one of those affairs or a class that Harley Trekker gave. And I think that I was, too, a part of that experiment uh, in the mid-40s when all kinds of things were happening. As you mentioned, two people, Thurman Fletcher, Bernice Wright Harper, or Bernice Wood, she is now, who was a part of that. So we were few and far between, and we did get to know people. But the thing that's most interesting to me is that when something important was going on, you were likely to see Henry in the midst of things. And I say this not only in terms of the School of Social Work, but also in terms of what you heard about people-coordinated services, 
I remember when I first came on the board, Henry was on the board, and then he says, oh no, I'm with the International Institute now, and then something else was going on and going on, but he never forgot to tie back to the people that uh, had been supporting and he'd been supporting. I think that um, it's very exciting because as I became connected with archives, we kept saying, you know, where is Henry Calvert? And I remember that Francis Bellman said, you know, he should be on this committee or he should be involved. And every time I see him, he says, oh, well, you know, I'm doing something for the Urban League. And I don't think he even mentioned some of the uh, data that he has collected and has been responsible for rescuing in our community. So I think that's one of the special things. So I'm really especially glad to see that he's kind of caught up with us and is really doing a, a creditable job with the archives. And I'm just happy to see all of you here because I know you represent so many interesting experiences uh, and that Henry has brought us together to reminisce. Thank you very much. I remembered one thing that I had intended to tell you, and that is Calvin has really come full circle from starting to work the Church Welfare Bureau and later serving on the board and then um, naming the agency, giving it, winning the contest for giving it its new name. He also wrote the history of the agency during the time that he was attending USC School of Social Work and uh, working for Church Welfare Bureau. He searched the records of the Church Federation. As you know, the Church Welfare Bureau was the social welfare arm of the Church Federation. And he searched the records and found out just how PCS came into being of the Church Welfare Bureau. And he did a paper on this in connection with his work at USC. That paper now serves as the history of the agency. We have just added to it to bring it up to date. So he's made a real contribution. Are there others who wish to Reminisce. It's an honor to be here. I know Robert for over 15 years, and I just wanted to support him in this that you guys are doing today. I think it's wonderful. Everywhere I go, I see Mr. Talbert. He is for social causes, and he's a wonderful man, and I just hope that one day I can be as useful in the community as he is right now. God bless you. Yes.
the university be, uh, was continuing its, its tradition of awarding honorary degrees at, at graduation. And our mutual mentor, Nori Glass, says to me, I want you to meet Henry Talbert and interview him so that the School of Social Work can nominate him for one of the honorary degrees. And those of you who know Norris know the degree to which he relied on tradition and quiet reason. So in the midst of all these times when deans were being locked up in doors until <laughs> they made concessions, Norris looked at the tradition of the Urban League with the innovations that um, Henry had brought to that organization is really a model that should be recognized and honored. And so his uh, charge to me was to interview Henry in order the school could update its knowledge of his career and his activities and submit Henry as the school's nomination that year for one of the honorary degrees. Well, the university, I think, was in such turmoil. And the look at traditional organizations and procedures just didn't really uh, get anybody's attention in those days. And I must say, it doesn't say a whole lot about my persuasive powers. <laughs> so we didn't get the, uh, our nomination was not accepted as one of the four for that year. But it did begin a, an acquaintance that has moved into a friendship and certainly a deep respect that I have for you all these years. And it's a pleasure to share this afternoon with you. Good afternoon. I am Ernest Leitner. And a number of you have mentioned that you met Henry while working in church welfare. Well, I met Henry while working in church. <laughs> uh, I might say at that time, all of his work there in the church was for the welfare of that church. I want to do a couple of things here. Number one, I want to congratulate Henry on coming this far in the career, the era that he is. And I say this far because he's not over. It's not over. He's still working it, all of you well know. As well as to congratulate the formers of this afternoon. This is a wonderful event, and I can't think of a person more deserving than Henry that this should happen. You know, I learned, you know, we worked, I guess, more years than we care to recall, the late 40s or early 50s at least, we began. I learned three things about Henry early on. Number one, that he had a you know, quick if subtle wit. And that you'd better listen to every word that he's saying, because with a very somber face, that of a judge, he would deliver a dis devastatingly humorous line. If you weren't listening, you might miss something. I also learned that, well, as we had were in meetings, trustee board meetings and business meetings in the church that Henry often had the same viewpoint that I had, which of course revealed to me his deep insight and understanding <laughs> and circumstance. Uh, but we recognized him as a good thinker. The next one took me a little while longer to learn. To be in meetings, and if you've been in church meetings, you know you can have 10 people and 20 opinions being expressed. Uh, at some times, there would be people saying things, and I said, no, that's not right, or I would have said whatever I had felt, and other people were going on, and I would be wondering, well, why doesn't Henry say something? Why doesn't Henry <laughs> say something? And ultimately, he would say something, and I noticed that would always be near the end of the meeting. After a while, it dawned on me. Henry had sat through the meetings, listened to the diverging opinions, and had found the common ground. This, I think, was his greatest asset, being able to find the common ground in 
a place of any number of opinions and finding some way in which the organization could again move forward in some direction uh, acceptable to all concerned. And I think had not been for Henry's ability to do that time and again, well, Lincoln Memorial might not be up there right now. I credit Henry with our existence in this very day. Again, Henry, congratulations. Thank you. I know there are people that Mr. Talbot would like to acknowledge and introduce, and at this time we're going to give him the opportunity to do that. Very quickly, I would, uh, well, Ms. Bellino uh, has been introduced, a psychiatric social worker at VA, a member of our church, one of the leaders, uh, Ms. Arzenia Red Cross. That's her name, not her agent. Ms. Red Cross. Uh, also, a person with whom recently we have been working on a health program, uh, Ms. Nan Young Lee. She's setting up her own home health agency, a registered nurse. Her agency is enhanced. Please take a bow. A colleague of mine on the board of the International Institute, a retired Beverly Hills educator, Mrs. Jeanette Moore. I think a member of the uh, social work alumni, but uh, Ms. Dorothy Martin. We've worked on some things with regard to the links and so forth in Pasadena, Altadena. A member of my church, uh, we're having conversations around health care uh, at the community level. She's a veteran of the Cancer Society, Mrs. Bernice Sanders. Uh, almost a relative, she and my Laker, like sisters, uh, Mrs. Samantha Williams in Pasadena. I, I don't want to miss anyone, and yet I know we're pressed for time. Are there others that uh, I respect you highly? That I <laughs> okay, so well, let, let me thank you. Oh, yes, oh, oh, you can introduce your wife, Ernest. Uh, yes. Mrs. Weldina Leitner, uh, former president of the Guild, Ladies' Guild in our church. They've gone on fantastic And let me wind up my part uh, by saying first that there won't be any re viewing of the remains. <laughs> but I will just find a beautiful story that. Uh, one Sunday, and I think it's fitting that we talk about it this time on the Sabbath, the school teacher shocked her little class by raising the question, how many of you want to go to heaven when you die? And all the little hands went up except one, little Sally. And the teacher raised the question again with the same result. So she moved over to little Sally and said, Sally, uh, did you hear the teacher's question? Yes. And you don't want to go to heaven when you die? Sally said, yes. And she looked around the room and said, but not with this crowd. <laughs> I thank all of you, and I, I hasten to add that this is, this is not the happening that it turned out to be, because this is just another one of the oral interviews that the Collections Committee is conducting. And there are many persons uh, who could take this same mic at this time and would have just as much to offer. So uh, I appreciate this, but it's another day at the office for the Collections Committee. Thank you. Congratulations, Mr. Calvert. I am one of your admirers, and you are a mentor. Uh, I went to school in Washington, D.C. and followed Henry Calvin, uh, Whitney Young, and many others, Frank yeah. Jordan, and others. Um, you are admired, and I try to read as much as possible about community organization, and I believe you are one of our leaders. So I want you to um, know that we appreciate you, 
and my name is Jean Oliver. I'm a licensed clinical social worker in private practice here in this community where you have worked and where you live and we appreciate you, especially on behalf of the many seniors uh, who receive services from people's coordinated services. I've worked with this agency for a long time and I want you to know that on behalf of the seniors in this community, that we, have, we appreciate you. Thanks again, Evelyn and Helen Maxwell and the committee, and the people from the University of the Archives. Uh, well, you'll be hearing something about Elon Burt at a big deal that the Archives are putting on October. Thank you. Thank all of you for your participation. We appreciate you coming out to help honor Henry Talbot. And now, having completed my assignment, I'm going to ask Mrs. Helen Maxwell if she wants the last word as chairperson of this committee. I think we're at the end of the Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to thank Henry for allowing us to honor him. Thank you. Thank you.